Hi, I'm Tim Belcher. Welcome to the shop. A while ago on this channel, I built a large slab table. I actually used two large ash slabs that were book matched or butterfly slabs. They had voids that I filled with resin. The table came out beautifully, but I did not build the chairs or the bench for it. We bought those. And over time, we've realized that bench is too short. It's six feet, we need eight. I do, however, behind me have a large third slab from that tree. It's much larger than I need, much longer, much wider. I need 14 inches wide by eight feet deep. This slab at the time was the most warped and the most twisted of the three, and I didn't want to use it in the tabletop. I'm not sure I can get a good live edge bench top out of it, but I'm going to get it up on the CNC and try. So this is a live edge bench top made out of that third ash slab. This is how I made it. I've said before that there are certain times in the shop where having an extra set of hands would be very helpful and moving these huge slabs was certainly one of those times. This slab was over 11 feet long and probably well over 150 pounds. I'm not sure how much conveys on camera, but this slab was checked, warped, twisted, and cupped, essentially in every way possible difficult to work with. In theory, when starting with a slab like this, you want to remove as much length and width as you can before flattening it to preserve as much thickness as possible to the finished piece. I considered using my track saw, my circular saw, and even took a hard look at my jigsaw to remove the checked ends. The first two options didn't feel safe to me, and I didn't think the jigsaw was up to the challenge, so I turned to my sawzall. And that proved to make quick work of trimming the length of the slab. And once I had the slab trimmed to about eight and a half feet long, it was time to try and figure out how to attach it to the table. And that was gonna be difficult as I had a full inch and a half, perhaps two inch twist on less than a three inch slab. Here I'm using the holes in my table to line the slab up along the Y axis. I'm gonna try my best to level the slab, which essentially means getting the opposite high corners to be as close to the same height off the table as possible. So here's where I'm at. I've got this slab on the table and leveled. It is heavy enough that I don't think it's going to move by itself with the bit. And I've got shims supporting the slab with hot glue keeping the shims in place and in some places keeping the shims to the table. It's ugly, it's not uh, the preferred method. There's no clamp, there's no hold downs. I haven't screwed through the board. What I'm gonna do is take this four inch flat half inch end mill and I'm gonna shove it through the slab all the way down about 15 inches from this edge. And what I don't want to happen is that slab to move during the cut so I'm gonna take shallow passes and I also don't want it to pinch on the bit or particularly flop away. That is less scary than actually pinching the bit. I think the slab is fairly secure where it's at. I'll keep my hand close to the emergency stop button and watch for chatter just in case. But right now I'm gonna to try to take the width of this down from about 22 inches to about 15. So I will zero the Z on the table I will then manually find how high the corners are, and that will give me the depth of cut for a straight pocket pass straight down the slab. I'm not gonna go into much depth on the digital side here, but for every cut you make, you need to define some representation of the slab and the cut you wanna make. And for this straight, simple cut, I'm defining a three quarter inch pocket that will extend out each end of the slab. The extra quarter of an inch is so that the pocket I'm making will have enough spare room to get rid of the sawdust and the chips that the bit will make. And lastly, I'll manually choose the raster angle of the cut to make sure that the bit is traveling only along the Y axis, essentially acting like a very slow saw cut. Now I know my dust shoe looks funny in this shot and is doing nothing for most of this cut, but it will however help toward the end 
And this is one of those times where it'd be nice to have a fixed height dust shoe. And because of that twist in the slab, it will start cutting at the high point on the back left and slowly cut down through the slab to the low point on the front. I had made it to about 80% of this job when the cutoff on the left did start to move and create some chatter. I was close enough to hit the stop button and know I could complete the remaining cut with a Sawzall. So now I had the slab trimmed to just slightly over my finished width and height and I could begin the flattening process. Even though the slab was still very twisted because I had removed seven or eight inches of width, the twist was reduced to perhaps an inch and a quarter and I finally started to feel like I could get a workable depth out of this slab. Just as with the smaller pocket, this process is simply creating a much wider pocket using this inch and a half flattening bit with a step over of about 50% taking very shallow passes of about 1 16th of an inch. And after each pass, I'd manually lower my Z 1 16th of an inch and rerun the job until I had surfaced one side. The total time for one side of this was about two hours. And I could have done it faster, but there was really no reason to push the feeds and speeds. I wanted a clean surface. And I did have to make several adjustments as the job was progressing, slowing my spindle speed and increasing my feed rate to avoid heat and burning. When I flipped it, even though I had one side flat, the slab did have some spring in the middle. So I set about figuring out how to fasten the middle to the table. My first attempt was hot glue and that failed miserably. Then I tried the super glue and tape trick. I figured it worked well on smaller pieces, so why not try more tape and more super glue for something much bigger? This is where you put down tape on the board and the table, and then you apply super glue to one side and activator to the other. In theory, this will create a very strong bond that can easily be broken without hurting the wood. I used a very heavy clamp to try and overcome that spring and let the glue set. And this didn't work either. So it was on to option three. I countersunk two holes in the slab and used some pocket screws to hold down the center of the slab. I figured I could easily cut some plugs out of the checked ends to fill these holes later. And once I had the slab attached and flat, I could surface the second side. I'll simply set my Z to the high point and use the same pocket path from the previous side. After another couple of hours, I have a slab that is perfectly flat on both sides that is just over one and a half inches deep. At this point, I'm feeling pretty good about this project. In general, this slab now looks a heck of a lot better than it did when I started. And now I just need to trim it to its final dimensions. I'll start that by first using the table again to line up the slab along the Y axis. And then I'll use those existing holes I had drilled to reattach it to the table. I'll switch to a long quarter inch end mill. And again, I'll use that trick to set the Z to the table and then manually find the top of the slab so I can measure my depth of cut. Now this pocket pass is gonna be a bit more complicated. I first make my stock the new dimensions of the slab, and then I draw a square that's 14 inches wide by eight feet tall, or the size of the bench top that I want. I'm gonna put a full one inch fillet on what will be the cut edge, both top and bottom. And then I can offset that line about one and a half times the width of the bit. I can then cut these vectors on the side of the live edge, join them and drag them out so that the bit will come straight out from the edge. This is gonna give me a pocket pass that trims both the length of the slab as well as one edge and leaving one edge live. I think it'll make more sense when you see the finished piece. Now, because I had trimmed this slab down to just over its finished dimensions, I knew that as this cut progressed, I was gonna have thin and unstable cutoffs. As the cut progressed, I did drill and secure the ends of the cutoffs with more pocket screws. 
Like before, I stayed close to the e-stop button in case the cuts started to chatter. I cleared away some of the areas I thought may be a problem as the job progressed. And as I expected, the thin cutoff did start to chatter at the end, but only after the pass that freed the finished slab from the waste. After that last pass where it freed the slab, I did stop the job early to make sure none of that chatter would damage the slab. And then I had my bench top. My original plan all along was to use the existing bench base to complete this project. The plan was to break down that bench and replace the two stretchers with longer ones. And I had even picked out two straight-ish 2x4s that could be milled down for that purpose. The existing bench was made by a company called Bassett, which, after a little research, seems to be a furniture maker with a great reputation here in the US. So I took the top off and began to disassemble the bench. The construction was simple enough, with pocket holes and corner braces. However, once I removed the hardware, I realized that whatever adhesive they had used to assemble the base left it solid as a rock. Off camera, I tried some not so gentle persuasion with a mallet, and then I came to the conclusion that I would likely damage the piece taking it apart. And so on to plan B. I'd have to copy their design and simply make a longer bench base. For the rails and stretchers, I could simply use the inexpensive fur 2x4s I had on hand. I knew they wouldn't be as strong as the maple ones in the original bench, but I could make them slightly thicker and thought they would hold up fine over the 8 foot span. For the legs, however, I decided to use some of the large maple stock I had left over from the Kitchen Island project. This maple was thick enough that I could easily get the nearly 2 inch square legs from a cutoff of one board. And after removing the rounded edges from the 2x4s, I then was able to get those four leg blanks from that large block of maple. The original bench legs had slight tapers on two sides of each leg, and I wanted to copy that profile. So I marked those two sides and set up my tapering jig. Now I'm not sponsored in any way on this channel, but I will say that using this micro jig tapering setup to me feels much safer. It allows me to not only get the exact same taper, but to keep some good downward pressure on the piece while my hands stay well away from the blade. I did the two tapers on each leg that matched as close as I could get to the original, and then sanded away any saw marks or burns. The originals had a quarter inch roundover on the outside corner, and perhaps an eighth inch round over on the other three corners. So I replicated that as well. And then finally each leg had a slight chamfer on the bottom edges, which I did on the belt sander. Then it was time to cut those stretchers and rails to length, and I used the chop saw to also cut blanks for those corner blocks. To get those 45 degree cuts, I was able to use my cross cut sled and a clamp to keep my hands clear. And if you think this little operation on the drill press looks a bit sketchy, uh, you're not alone. I did as well, but it seemed to work fine. A quick sand on all the pieces with both the rotary as well as a finish sander, and I was ready for some assembly. Even this assembly was copied from the original, with each stretcher and rail connecting into the legs with two pocket hole screws. The corner blocks had been pre-drilled, and the stretchers and rails had upward-facing pocket holes drilled to attach the slab. I put together each of the end assemblies of the bench first, and then I could use the CNC bed and some flat clamping systems to attach each stretcher. This just let me put some pressure on the 8 foot span while I seated the pocket screws. Then I glued and attached the corner blocks and they not only squared up the bench but also provided quite a bit more stability. And there you have it, my cheap knockoff of a quality bench. But when you put that slab top on it 
even my mediocre quality bench does look a little bit better. Okay, so quickly onto the finish. I worked the grits from 40 to 220 on both the top and the bottom of the slab and used mostly the finish sander on the live edge as I wanted to keep the character from the beetles. And I did use an off cut from one of those checked ends to create a couple of dowels that I can use to plug those holes that I used to hold the slab flat while we processed it. And a little bit of work with a flush cutting saw and they virtually disappear. And something I've done several times on the channel is use resin to fill cracks and voids, so I won't spend much time on this. I will mention that since the cracks were small, the blue resin looked a bit green after. I should have made that resin much more blue. And I'm sure that Bassett used much finer quality paints than I did. However, after looking at the bench, I was fairly certain that it was simply a flat black followed by a matte clear coat. And that's what I chose to use here, some Rust-Oleum flat black put on in very thin coats, and then followed by a Rust-Oleum acrylic clear coat. And next to each other, I think both the color and the finish are fairly spot on. Now that the base was done, I needed to go back and remove that resin from the slab and touch up those areas and get them back to a solid 220 grit. And I followed that with an eighth inch round over just where anyone's legs may touch the bench. And then it was on to the clear coat. And for that, mostly because I was pressed for time, I went with a spray on lacquer. I wanted something, actually needed something, where I could spray on multiple coats in a single day. And for this, I think I did about 11. And that's about it. Let's measure, center, and attach this top and we've got a completed bench. Hey, if you like this project and you made it this far, come on, hit that like button and subscribe. In the end, I think the Bassett bench was certainly better built, certainly constructed better. But this new one fits, and it fits well. Thanks for watching.